Amen. My mother's favorite hymn. Thank you, Jenny and Joy. You know, miracles happen, and uh, we have two. I don't normally do this, but uh, look, we've got Barry Bledsoe back from being run over, and uh, Carrie Moore is back today. <laughs> Barry looked so handsome, we were going to see if you could do that again. You just keep improving. <laughs> and we finally got a pencil to match Jim Balkama. Um, one that Jim can use, and Sharon Wyndham's going to play bass for us tonight, <laughs> or today, so thank you all. We are just grateful that you're here today to worship with us, and we want you to relax and enjoy this worship service, and we want you to participate. So if you would take your hymnals, turn to hymn number 184, Jesus is all the world to me, and also 140, down at the cross. We'll stand together as we sing both these great hymns. Jesus is all the world to me, my life, my joy, my all. He is my strength from day to day, without Him I would fall. When I am sad to Him I go, no other one can cheer me so. When I am sad, Jesus. 
Jesus so sweetly abides within, there at the cross where he took me in. Glory to his name, glory to his name, glory to his name. There to my heart was the blood of spells it out so clearly for us. I was so wondrously saved from sin. Jesus so sweetly abides within. There at the cross, he took us in. This morning, we've come to recognize and to celebrate that wonderful truth, that there at the cross, he took us in. Because of what Jesus did on the cross, we are one fellowship, one body who has been saved by the blood of Jesus and nothing else. Nothing else satisfies. Nothing else gives peace. Nothing else completely saves us like Jesus. And so there at the cross, Jesus took us in, and that's why we proclaim glory to his name. Thank you for being here today. It's a joy to sing together, to celebrate together, to smile together, to enjoy the fellowship and presence of one another. If you have your order of service on the back of it, you've got our scripture memory for the month of June. And so let's say it just as we sang together in one accord. Let's say our scripture together in one accord in Romans chapter 5, verse 8, it says, But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 5, 8. Fantastic. Y'all got it down by the end of June here. Y'all can have a seat. Well done. We continue to say those, believe those, live those, and allow those to just continue to percolate in our hearts as we live them out uh, in the world around us. I would encourage you to take your Connect card, and you'll notice that we are in black and white this week because the same uh, purple ink that we need for the pew coverings are also needed for ink for the printers, and apparently <laughs> nobody can find purple ink. So uh, black and white there for no other reason than we need purple ink. But you'll see there in your order of service uh, the Connect card, and at the bottom, as always, is your opportunity to respond to how, however the Lord would lead you this morning. Every week, uh, hundreds of folks turn in prayer requests, and it is our honor and our privilege to pray for and right alongside you. So turn in one of your cards. If you're a visitor here, we would love to pass off a gift to you and encourage you. You can do that right here on this little Connect card. You can leave it in the pew as you leave or turn it into an usher. And also, you see opportunities for engagement. There are awesome opportunities this summer for preschoolers and children and youth, and so you can register for those events right here and uh, also upcoming opportunities as well. As you look in your order of service, you see that tomorrow or tonight we have our VBS recap. Right after the service tonight at 515, we'll walk across the street and have inflatables and a family fun night. And it would be a splendid opportunity for you, whether you are here at VBS or not, to see what happened this past week. Nearly 600 individuals, preschoolers, children, volunteers, workers, teachers, snack makers, gathered here in this place to pour God's transforming truth into young and eager hearts. It was a fantastic week. And so tonight, we'll come back and celebrate God's goodness this entire week. And uh, some of you got good rest this weekend because it was a long but wonderful, wonderful week. And as we continue this morning, I want to lead us just in a time of prayer as we continue our service. Lord, we, we pause right here in the middle of the service just to continue to ask your presence to be made known amongst us. Lord, I recognize that for some who have walked into this room, they are weary and tired and they are burdened with all sorts of issues on their heart this morning. So Lord, I pray that we would fix our eyes, that we would focus our eyes directly onto you this morning through the words that we sing, through the meditations of our heart, through the prayers that we lift up and through your word that is spoken and preached in just a few moments. Lord, I don't know what each person is walking through personally, but I know that we're all walking through something. 
Lord, we thank you that you have welcomed us in through your grace, through your sacrifice on the cross. We can, with joyful celebration, recognize that our sins have been taken away as far as the east is from the west. And so let our lives be a reflection of what you have done for us as we sing glory to your name, as we lift up the majesty of your name. Lord, as we continue on in the service, let our eyes be fixated on you and your transforming truth. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. ask you to stand up as we sing Stand Up, Stand Up for Jesus, hymn number 485, and also hymn number 613, The Servant Song.
This past year, our church has been incredibly blessed uh, to have Jeff Holland serve as our deacon chairman. And this Sunday is his last Sunday as official deacon chairman of our church. <laughs> it's not been that bad, has it? No, it's been great. <laughs> um, but I just wanted to take a moment and say thank you to you, Jeff. It has been a tremendously difficult year for all of us here at the church, but you have been a hand of steadiness. And as we just sang a moment ago, the servant song, you have exemplified what it means to be a, a servant leader in our church. And from my heart and from our church, I want to say thank you to you, Jeff, and your incredible leadership as our deacon chairman. Would you help me say thank you to Jeff? You'll also notice in your order of service that the Lord has brought to us 20 more deacons to serve. You know, every three years we have a rotation, 20 deacons a year. And so this year we have 20 new incredible deacons who will serve. And you'll see those asterisks by the names of those who will be ordained for the very first time on August 7th uh, in the main sanctuary at 6 o'clock. So hope that you already uh, mark your calendars to be there. That's always an encouraging night to encourage those new brothers who will serve as deacons. But Jeff, we want to say thank you to you and enjoy uh, the fellowship of our church who is blessed with, at most times, 60 incredible deacons serving the Lord faithfully at our church. You guys clapping before I took on this term, I had a full head of hair. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would like to say... Uh, uh, for Barry Bledsoe, uh, we were over in Callaway Garden playing in the, in the golf tournament when we got the news of, of his accident. And I think I uh, hit my shot in the water and uh, Don Schofield dribbled heels off the tee, so you caused all of our handicaps to rise. Thank you. <laughs> well, good to have you back. And Carrie, uh, where's Carrie? Where's Carrie Moore? Carrie. Well, Carrie, I just want you to know that uh, Denise and I watch the INSP channel a lot. And there's a young lady that on a commercial, she looks so much like you. So every time we saw her, we always thought of you and we prayed, prayed for you as well. So I got notes this morning. It's been a faithful honor of mine to serve this passage of Deacon Chapman and what an amazing year we've experienced. Each of us can go back in our own hearts and minds and reflect back over the highlights of the year, and there has been many. Uh, but as the old saying say, but God. 
I'd like to thank several key people. First of all, Mrs. Denise Holland, over there in the corner. Denise, stand up, baby. And, <clears throat> and I want to say, brother, that if you're, not, if you're not consulting your helpmates, your wife, you will not give God your best. Uh, without Denise, my leadership would have been at best average. So thank you, sweetie. Appreciate you. Uh, to Ben and Connie Hulsey, uh, who served as your vice chair uh, and a true company of mine, I thank him. To Bo, Brittany, Reed, and Gaines Daniel, who I think are out of town this week, he served as your secretary treasurer. Uh, he was so organized and he kept us on track the whole time. Other committee chair was Don Cook of our banker committee, and we ate like king's servants. With the, Jason Herbert, who was our baptismal committee, one of the most humblest men that I know. John Ashworth over the Lord's Supper Committee. John is so well balanced, instructor, and professional, and such an awesome leader. Steve Faulkner took over the Deacon, Deacon uh, Flock Committee. He spurred us on to communicate with our Sunday school classes even when we were on Zoom. Hank Tuton, the Education and Spiritual Growth Committee. Hank is so full of the Holy Spirit, and he grew us in Christ by selecting awesome books to read, like uh, The Prodigal Son, Spiritual Leadership, Screw Take Letters, and we also did Proverbs for two months where every deacon had a proverb that they had to reflect on that we all shared. And Bob Howard over our Senior Care Committee. Bob has been and is a true compassion for our seniors here at FBC. So thank you guys and the spouses too, Miss Diane, Miss Sydney, Ivy, Sandy, Brenda, and Miss Libby. For all the brothers that serve under their committees, each of them could fill any position. That's how the Lord has blessed uh, First Baptist Church. And your newly elected officer, I can't tell you who they are, but wow. I rotate off, but I'm probably going to crash every event that they have because it's going to be in such great shape. So thank you for those. To Kenny Holmes, uh, Carolyn Bryant, Patty Shoemaker, Amanda Smith, Justin Law, Kathy Cooper, Vicki Bryant, Andre and Ronald Phillips, uh, Scott Lamb, appreciate all you guys have done and how you helped me and the church who all prayed for me as well. But one thing I want to say is that we stood on the shoulders of great leadership here at First Baptist Church. I'm almost done. <laughs> Men like David Martin, Douglas McKelvey, Troy Teal, Ben Kelly, Stuart Hendon, John Ashworth, Mark Williams, Rush Stallin, Mike Rowell, Bill McCrary, Barry Bledsoe, Andy Birchfield, Bo Cooper, Dora, Dora Powell, Billy Irvin, Buddy Ingram, Ron Trotman, Bill Nix, Tony Espy Jr., Burt Martin, Jerry Britton, Jim Robinson, Bill Bayard, Buddy Carroll, Douglas Rickney, Bowen Bishop, Wayland Nobles, Burt Silvis, Earl Dove, Boyd Christianberry, who served four terms as your deacon chair, Hugh Maddox, Lewis Fye Jr., Sam Simon, Simmons, Henry Steindorf, Noble Green Hill, B.L. Mason, Thomas Bell, H.D. Parks, Fred White, Neil R. Smart, Carol Griggs, and all the way back to 1956, N.J. Bell. Finally, to you, my brother. We prayed together, we cried together, and we made some tough decisions together. And we've grown together. I've, I've seen you grow. I, I, I feel the growth in me as well. I'm so excited for First Baptist Church, for you, Brittany, your family. You are my pastor, my brother, and my friend. Let's pray. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we just thank you so much for First Baptist Church, Lord. We thank you for the leadership at this church, the staff at this church, Lord. We are so blessed. And now, Father, we want to take an opportunity to tell you how much we need you. Uh, there was a tough decision that was made this week in the, in, in the Supreme Court. And uh, you've taken a divided nation. We've taken a divided nation, divided it, divided it even more. So we need you more than we've ever needed you before. So, Father, we thank you. We love you. We pray for a blessing and our cheerful giving of our tithes and our offerings that we use our time and our talents and our treasures for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> sleep. 
tenderly Jesus is calling, calling, oh sinner, come home. Why should we tarry when Jesus is pleading, pleading for you and for me? Why should we linger and heed not his mercies, mercies for you and for me? Appreciate so much you and Eunice and your faithful service to our church. If you have your Bibles this morning, if you would open with me to Psalm 139. This morning, uh, as we have watched uh, what has happened in this past week, and as I turned in my outline for Mark 10, Jesus on marriage, uh, on Tuesday when I turned it in, I had no blanks to put down on the sheet of paper. And it bothered me a little bit because I knew it would bother a lot of y'all a lot bit to not have blanks and a blank sheet of paper. But it turns out the Lord knew what he was doing on Tuesday night when I did not have blanks to fill out because uh, we will not this morning talk about Jesus on marriage. But we will instead turn our attention to Psalm 139 and looking at what has happened in our nation. Again, this week as things came out as they did... um, I began to write just a little bit to share with you this morning at the beginning of our time, just to give us some words of encouragement, and those five minutes turned into ten minutes, turned into fifteen minutes, turned into our entire sermon time. And so I I pray that this is an encouragement to you. I pray these words are helpful and instructive for us. 
as we go through this time. So there you've got a complete blank slate for you to take notes or write down what the Lord would draw your heart to. I don't find it coincidental that this week, as we were enjoying a week of vacation Bible school in which nearly 600 parents, preschoolers, kids were in the hallways of our church learning God's gospel truth as teachers were pouring into the hearts of the youngest in our church and faith family. As I rounded a corner from making a phone call and heard one of our incredible preschool workers humming the tune of Jesus loves me over one of our young, irritable preschoolers who just simply would not go to sleep. As I saw the church rally to love and care for our church preschooler and children's, it was under that backdrop that we received the news that the Supreme Court had overturned the Dobbs case and would return the legality of abortion to the states meaning that many states have already enacted laws to prevent abortion and legalize or make abortion illegal. And Alabama will be one of those states where thousands upon thousands upon thousands of lives will be saved instantaneously. And in that, we rejoice. But I want to pause in the midst of this discussion because I know it makes some of us squirm and it makes us uncomfortable to talk about such things in the church. And I also want to pause in this moment because I recognize that if statistics were to hold true, the statistics about abortion were to be accurate, that there are many in this room and who are watching online right now who have either sought after an abortion, who have paid for an abortion, who have encouraged others to seek after an abortion. And in that, I recognize that the discussion about it or this week's court case about it could bring up and would bring to the surface many an old wound and scars that are deeply troubling. Abortion has been called the silent killer because it both takes the life of an unborn child, but it also usually leaves deep and abiding scars in the life of the mom that take a lifetime to overcome. And so it's with that that I want to speak with the most grace and compassion that I possibly can. I pray that you as a church, you online, hear my words speaking with as much grace and compassion as I possibly can muster. I want to speak to you who have had an abortion, who have contemplated an abortion, who have paid for an abortion, who have brought someone to take someone for an abortion. I want to remind you that God's grace is sufficient, it is real, and it is ever-present. I want you to know that we as a people stand here as people who have been saved by God's abundant grace. I've told you many a time that we have family that lives at the beach, and so we often go to the beach, and I've shared the story with you before, but I want to share it again Because it's a reminder of the God that we celebrate and we sing to and that we worship and who we have all been welcomed at the foot of the cross to. That from a young age, I have enjoyed going to the beach and enjoyed uh, picking picking up water in those baskets and taking them up, making sand castles. I've oftentimes walked into the beach house with my feet full of sand. And at, at no point as I walk into the beach house with my feet full of sand, much to the frustration of all the adults into the room, Have I ever thought that I need to get sand and pull it off and bag it into a Ziploc bag and take it back to the beach because there's a fear that the beach may run out of sand? At no point when I'm scooping up water in those pails to make sand castles do I ever wonder or fear that it's possible that I've gotten the last bucket of water in the ocean. What we all know and recognize is that ocean, as far as the eye can see and as far as we can travel down to the depths of the ocean, there is water abundant for everyone who would come to the water of the ocean. That there is sand as far as the eye can see and as far as the feet can walk. There is sand everywhere to be found. There is water everywhere to be found. And your little bucket full of ocean water does not in any way exhaust the ocean that is before you. And in the same way, we recognize God's abundant grace. That I know that if God can save a sinner such as I, and I don't say that flippantly, or God can save just a sinner like me, I'm your preacher, I don't do that much wrong. No, no, no. If God can save a sinner like me, if we as a church have been praying earnestly for 10 months that he would save an arsonist who tried to burn our church down and believe with every fiber of our being that God can indeed save a church arsonist, 
then we simply believe that God can have his abundant grace available, free and abundant to you. And so I believe with every depth in me that you who wrestle with, believe and have the scars of who wrestle with, could God love you after such a thing, I can confidently say from the truth and the clarity of God's word that yes, he can. It's what he does. It's who he is. And I want to be equally clear about how God feels about abortion, but also who God is in his truth of grace in the gospel. And so as we walk through this time, be equally clear of God's view of abortion, but also how a loving God views you in the gospel. That all who call upon the name find the equal ground and equal footing at the free and fullness of God's grace. And here in this church, you will not find a wagging finger of condemnation. You will find open arms to welcome you into the fellowship of God's grace because we are all in need of God's saving grace in our life. We wouldn't be here if we didn't need God's free and abundant grace. So let's just meet there right where we are, recognizing that we are all equally in need of God's grace. So with that compassionate, grace-filled heart, let's take ourselves to Psalm 139 and just spend a moment looking at these words from the psalmist of David to our hearts this morning. Before we do that, let's, let's pray together. Dear Lord, we... We need your guidance, we need your leadership, we need your grace on our hearts this morning. We need compassionate lips, we need grace-filled hearts, Lord. Would you teach us the wisdom of words, the wisdom of actions that we would live as people who have been changed and marked by the gospel of Jesus Christ. But Lord, we celebrate the lives that will be saved. We also recognize that there is yet much work to be done. So teach us, Lord. Give us genuine, pure hearts. Give us a motivation that stems from your gospel work in our lives. Lord, we love you. And we thank you for Jesus. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. As we turn our hearts to Psalm 139, let me read this for us. And let these words hit your heart in the truest of forms. The psalmist David writes, O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up, you discern my thoughts from afar. Even that is staggering. Even that is staggering that over the billions of people on this earth, the intimacy by which our God knows you, that he knows you're rising and you're lying down, that you're not just one in the mass sea of people. He knows how intimately you, when you rise up and when you lay down, the intimacy by which our God knows us, that he knows our sitting down and our rising up. He discerns our thoughts. He searches out our path and our lying down and are acquainted with not some of, not a portion of, not just the big decisions that we make. He is acquainted with all of our ways. Feel that for a moment. That the God of this universe is acquainted with all all of your ways. Think of the intimacy by which the God who flung the stars in the sky knows intimately you. Not just as a whole, he knows you individually, personally. He hears your prayers. He hears your cries for help. He knows you intimately. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all together. You hem me in, behind me and before, and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high, and I cannot attain it. Amen to that. How high it is that when we begin to think about who this God is, that he would know all this stuff. It is so lofty, so high. At some point, you just say, it's too much to even think about. It hurts the brain to think about how lofty and high, how much his knowledge, how unsearchable his ways must be. Where shall I go, verse 7, from your spirit, or where shall I flee from your presence? Ask Jonah, is there anywhere that he can go where God is not? Is there any place that we can go to flee from his presence to know where you are? Is there a place that you can be where God simply is not? Of course not. If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and the light shall be about me, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is as bright as the day, for darkness is as light with you. 
For you formed my inward parts, and you knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes, your eyes, Lord, saw my unformed substance. In your book was written every one of them, the days that are formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. Think for a moment the depth of God's handiwork over you, the intricate nature by which he wove us, you together, in your mother's womb. That you are not some cosmic accident that simply appeared here one day. That you are lovingly and fearfully made by the creator of this universe. Before your eyes saw anything, God saw you. Before you had a thought in your brain, the Lord knew you and the number of your days. Before an ultrasound would reveal your arrival to your parents or before a sonogram would see your face light up a screen in some room, God knew you and knew the number of your days and he was intricately weaving you together in your mother's womb. Before we uttered a cry or opened our eyes, Before an ultrasound saw or we heard a heartbeat, God knew, God saw, God crafted, and God created. As technology has advanced and we have begun to see these sonograms that are absolutely fascinating to look at. We've seen God's handiwork as the body begins to form an ID and a body is sucking its thumb as it winces and pain is felt. As Brittany lay on that little table to look at our little kids, it was fascinating as the technician would poke the belly to find the kid in there. That oftentimes the Micah, Helen, Anna, Nora in the womb would turn and move because trying to avoid that probe hitting on the belly. That that baby in the womb is moving around, averse to pain, sucking its thumb, heart is beating, organ is formed. What we see on that screen reminds us of what Psalm 139 makes clear and plain to us. If we continue on, Psalm 22, 9 through 10, Yet you are he who took me from the womb. You made me trust at my mother's breast. On you I was cast from my birth, and from my mother's womb you have been my God. Psalm 127, verse 3, Truly, children are a gift from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Friends, as a culture, we have not seen children and life as a gift from God, as a reward, as a precious gift from Him. We have devalued life at every level of life. From the moment of conception to the moment that we pass on from this life, we as a culture have not done a good job holding to the sacredness of life from the womb to the tomb. That we hold that every child, every person is an image bearer made in the image of God. We recognize what God tells us at the very beginning that every person is made in the image and likeness of God. That is why we recognize, Psalm 127, that children are a gift from the Lord. That they were made in the image of God. That we are not just simply some created being that walks on the face of this planet. We are not simply an animal or cattle. We are made in the image and likeness of our God. This is why we have celebrations of life. While we celebrate all life from birth until death. You also see in Luke chapter 2. As John the Baptist meets Jesus in the womb. Before John the Baptist and Jesus are brought forth from the womb, what do you see happen in Elizabeth's belly as John the Baptist leaps for joy that John the Baptist did not begin to be John the Baptist when he emerged from his mother's womb. Jesus did not begin to be Jesus when he emerged from Mary's womb. No, in the womb they leapt for joy at the presence of one another. That my three kids did not begin to be my three kids the moment they emerged from the womb in the hospital room. They were my kids the moment of conception. And so we see in Psalm 127 the joy and the preciousness of the gift of God. And even in Galatians 1, Paul recognizes this when he says in Galatians 1.15, but when he had set me apart before I was even born. 
Paul recognizes all that Paul had been through, walked through, that he had set me apart before I was even born. Before there was a number of life on this side of the womb, there was a, a, a day in which God knew who we were and he called us by his grace. At the core, I pray that we see as a church God's deep and abiding care for us. The intimate knowledge and nature that we carry as image bearers. And so with that, we look at and what has happened in our world. And Gregory Kokel, a theologian and philosopher, would say, if the unborn is not a human person, then no justification for abortion is necessary. If the unborn is not a human person, then there is no justification for abortion that is necessary. That if it is simply a clump of cells, that if it is like an appendix or a kidney, that it can be removed with no consequence and there is no, no necessary justification for abortion. And we have seen over time as science and sonograms and all sorts of things have reminded us what we clearly know. But we would say if the unborn is not a human person, then there is no justification for abortion that is necessary. But on the flip side, if the unborn is a person, if the unborn is a person, then there is no justification for abortion that is adequate enough. That that baby is not just an appendix or a kidney. It has its own fingerprints, its own blood type, its own organs. And so with that, the, the primary question that often arises is, is, what do we do? What do we do as believers now that in Alabama, the abortion is illegal, now that across the nation there are questions raging about the legality of abortion, then what do we do in Montgomery, Alabama, at First Baptist Church? What do we do as believers now that this has become a cataclysmic decision in our culture? What do we do? And so let me give us just some practical words. But let me also not say that this starts with today is the day that we start. Can I tell you that for years upon years upon years upon years, the church of Jesus Christ and believers have been on the front lines of ministry to mothers and expecting moms and all sorts of whole life approaches to life. That this is a knock on the Christian church, but it's simply not true. That believers are on the front lines having crisis pregnancy centers throughout the United States, throughout Montgomery. That believers are two times more likely to adopt children than unbelievers. And can we do more? Of course we can do more. Of course we can do more to stand up for life. Of course we can do more in all of these avenues. And I would gladly receive that. And we always can do more. But to say that we only care about a mom to give birth and then we care not more after that is simply untrue. As we look back, and I'll just give you some encouragement to what this may look like, this past year, we graduated seven from our first class of mentorship for those who are walking through the uh, opportunity to abort or those who have decided to give birth. Seven were trained through our church to be mentors to those moms and dads who are thinking of getting abortion, are thinking and decided to keep their kids so they could walk beside them to encourage them, to love them, to meet needs, to help them and walk beside them. This past year, we graduated our first class of seven. And in August, we will have our second class. And I would encourage you to pray about what it would look like for you to be a mentor to a mom or to a dad who is abortion-minded or who maybe decided to keep their child and are now walking forward with their child, wondering what to do, how it's all going to work. They need believers to walk beside them. So I would encourage you and pray that in August that you would sign up, take the class, and be a part of mentoring. Already of those seven, half of them have walked beside and mentored parents or those who are considering becoming parents. I would also remind you that our Caring Center ministry gives out hundreds and thousands of diapers and wipes a year, helps families with gift cards and financial assistance, encourages young families when they have needs. Our Caring Center does an incredible job. And yes, it could do more, but it is on the front lines even today. And I would encourage you, send diapers, send wipes, send onesies, send cribs. We will take them and we will give them to families who are in need. It's what we do here at our church. I would encourage you, consider donating, consider giving to the Caring Center, consider vol volunteering, walking beside those who are in need. I can tell you, because I've seen it, diapers, wipes, food, 
clothing, gift cards, financial assistance, families stepping up to the plate to help families who are in need all the way through from birth until their final days. I would also encourage you to consider looking at ministries like Alabama Baptist Children's Home. When you give to our church, we give to the Alabama Baptist Children's Home through part of the cooperative program. And they are helping foster and put uh, kids in homes constantly. Ministries like Lifeline are doing incredible work through adoption and foster care. And at that, church, I want to tell you that I am praying that there would be believers that would rise up amongst us who would take the call to adoption and foster care. Already in our midst, there are incredible families who are adopting and fostering and doing an incredible, incredible job in our midst, fostering and adopting children. There are others who are in process of adopting and fostering at this very moment. There are others who are taking classes to become certified to be a foster parent, to be an adoptive parent. And I would, with everything in us, pray that the Lord would open your heart, that you would be open and receptive to the reality that God may be calling you to adopt or to foster. We know James 1.27 tells us that religion that God our Father finds pure and undefiled is to care for widows and orphans in their distress. So church, would you maybe pray about what it would look like for us as believers in the Big C Church to take the problem and the issue of fostering and adoption and orphans off the page in Montgomery. That you would earnestly seek the Lord's face and say, Lord, are you calling me to adoption? Are you calling me to foster? Are you calling me to be a respite family? Are you calling me to encourage a family who is adopting and fostering? There are incredible ministries in our city and in our midst that are doing a fantastic job. And I thank you to the families that are on the front lines of this ministry. And I pray the Lord would rise up more in our midst who would take the calling of adoption and foster care and pray that the Lord would lead in all the right ways. There are also a smattering of incredible volunteer ministries, crisis pregnancy centers, and all sorts of wonderful ministries in our city that many of you are actively engaged in at this moment. I would pray and encourage you, donate, give, serve, help those incredible ministries. And for years, at 6 o'clock, right across the street from the abortion clinic, pastors across our city have been praying earnestly for the end of abortion. And so I would ask you to continue to pray. Pray for our nation that is divided. Pray for those who are struggling with these issues. Continue to pray. And for our last few moments, I want us to do specifically that. So would you join your hearts with mine as we conclude this morning simply by praying. Lord, we want to stop this morning and simply cry out to you, Lord. Lord, as we join our collective hearts together, Lord, I want to pray for those who this past week has been a reminder of a past. Lord, I want to Just pray that you would overwhelm them with your grace and your love and your mercy and your compassion. Or that they would be nourished by the truth of your word. That you would heal the scars and the wounds that they have experienced. That we as a church would come alongside to love and care for. But I pray for those ministries in our city who are serving. Lord, I pray that you would supply their needs, that you would bring more, that there would never be an empty shelf when there's a need for diapers and wipes and formula and food and clothing and cribs. I pray for those in our midst today who are wrestling with the call to foster and to adopt. Lord, I pray that you would make it clear and plain in their hearts. Lord, I pray that they would open the doors. I pray that we would all pray about what it looks like for each of us individually. To stand for life, both at the moment of conception, but all throughout life. That we would stand up for the rights and the needs of those who are weak and those who are vulnerable. That we would value life as made in your image, as image bearers. 
where we celebrate life. We celebrate life from the moment of conception to the moment of death. Lord, we pray your wisdom upon us, that we as your mouthpieces would speak with such grace and truth and love and compassion. It is not a moment of gloating in our country. It's a moment of compassion and grace and love and kindness that we would walk forward as believers humbly, seeking to demonstrate the adoption that we have found in you as adopted sons and daughters, that we would humbly walk with you, that we would demonstrate that what we have learned, that we were dead in our sins and trespasses, but you have made us alive together with Christ that we would recognize and hold true to Psalm 139 that you knew us even before our days were counted on this earth. So Lord, lead us, guide us, show us the way, Lord. Fill us with your Christ-like love and compassion. We desperately need you, Lord, to show us the way. It's in Jesus' name that we pray, amen. And we're gonna sing a concluding hymn, hymn number 294. That him is have thine own way. And this morning, I, I do pray that you would just simply pray that, that truth in your own heart. Lord, would you have your own way in me? Would you teach me? Would you show me? Lord, would you have your way in my heart that I would lead and follow your way? Maybe today you would, you would need the Lord's leadership in your life. Maybe you don't know what it feels like to have God's grace abound in your life. You feel the weight and shackles of sin in your life, and you are ready to break free. I'll be here at the front as we sing this song. I would love to receive you and welcome you in and tell you all about what Jesus has done. Maybe today you're ready to join this family of faith, family to encourage you and walk with you through life's ups and life's downs, through life's tremendously difficult journeys. We will be here to receive you and welcome you into this family of faith. Or maybe you would just simply say, I need a moment at this altar to pray and to ask the Lord's blessing and wisdom as we walk forward. Whatever it is, let's stand and let's sing and let's respond to hymn number 294, Have Thine Own Way. Have Thine Own Way, Lord, have Thine Own Way, Thou art the potter, I am the clay, mold me Thank you for being here today. What a joy to celebrate and be a part of God's activity here at our church. I would remind you to come back tonight for our VBS recap. We've left up some of the wonderful artwork and handiworks that you could see. And even if you weren't able to be there, participate alongside us. But it's going to be a fantastic night here at 515. And then once we finish, we'll walk right across to the Perry Street parking lot. It'll cool down by then. We'll have inflatables, pizza, Kona ice, all sorts of good stuff will be out there for free just to enjoy family fellowship. And even if you don't have kids or grandkids, just come out for the fellowship. It's a joy to see all the kids doing all the movements to the songs and reciting scripture. It'll flood your heart with joy to be here tonight. And as we've spoken earlier, it's a joy, Barry, to have you. I know you've uh, run over by a car, and here you are this morning to God be the glory. And Carrie, to see you here as well. The last time I saw you, you were in a hospital bed. And I am so overjoyed to see you here this morning singing your heart out to the Lord. It is absolutely amazing. And I am so thankful that you're here this morning. And then this morning, I also got a text uh, from Bill Lambert. Bill was standing behind a pulpit preaching in Brazil. How incredible. 
How incredible to see three testimonies of God's grace. Bill Lambert, stage three pancreatic cancer. There he is in Brazil, preaching God's word in Brazil. Terrible accident with Carrie, run over by a car, and here we all are, praising the Lord and thanking him for his goodness. So it is a joy to be together. Kenny, would you come and would you pray us away this morning? Thank you, my brother. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for these answered prayers that Mark has mentioned during this hour. And we pray your continued blessings on these three, and particularly Bill as he's there in Brazil. Lord, throughout this past week, we have reminded children in Vacation Bible School that they are created, designed, and empowered for your purpose. And during this message this day, those same words have been used in a different way in a challenge for each of us. And so we ask that we would also remember your words to be salt and light. And as we leave this place, may we pour on the salt and turn on the light of the love of Jesus Christ in our world. In Jesus' name we pray. Praise God.